Thank you, Bob, for that tour of history. Now we're going to the second part of this, which is going to look at the, essentially, the current environment. I'm going to retitle this segment, though, uh, Goldstein Answers America, because our guest, Tom Goldstein, is really the, the, uh, the go-to guy, if you're a political reporter, about the current uh, state of uh, the political ads. And I just want to say one thing before Tom starts. It's, it, this current campaign is only half over. And yet we may not get a better epitaph for the campaign than one provided by historian and candidate Newt Gingrich, who said in late December, politics is a nasty, vicious, negative, and disgusting business. Um, pretty good quote. Of course, Newt said this on December 30th, when only five of every 10 ads in Iowa were negative, though many of them were aimed at him. That late December, the halcyon days of the 2012 campaign. To bring us up to speed on how it really looks now, Tom Goldstein, who's the president of the Campaign Media Analysis Group, used to be at the University of Wisconsin as a political, political science professor, director of the Wisconsin Advertising Project, and as I said, knows more about the data and the ads in this race than any really, anyone else alive. So come on up, Tom. So Tom couldn't be here, so you have to set it for Ken Goldstein. But um, got the first name wrong, but no Sorry. big deal. Um, let's, uh, let me start by showing a um, number of ads that are currently are currently aired in this Republican presidential primary. And then what I really want to do is not so much talk about what's going on currently, but put into context what the use and effect of negative ads are. But let's first start by looking at some of those, uh, some of those ads. It's the story of a lost city, lost opportunity, lost hope. A story of failed policies, failed leadership. A story of smooth-talking politicians, insider deals, games of he said, she said, rhetoric and division. One man has stood apart, stood strong and true. Voting against every tax increase, every unbalanced budget, every time. Standing up to the Washington machine, guided by principle. Ron Paul, the one with a plan to cut a trillion dollars year one, eliminate the waste, balance the budget. Ron Paul, the one we can trust, the one who will restore America now. I'm Ron Paul, and I approve this message. Know what makes Barack Obama happy? Newt Gingrich's baggage. Newt has more baggage than the airlines. Freddie Mac helped cause the economic collapse, but Gingrich cashed in. Freddie Mac paid Newt $30,000 an hour, $1.6 million. Gingrich not only teamed up with Nancy Pelosi on global warming, but together they co-sponsored a bill that gave $60 million a year to a UN program supporting China's brutal one-child policy. As speaker, Gingrich even supported taxpayer funding of some abortions. And Newt is the only speaker in history to be reprimanded. He was fined $300,000 for ethics violations by a Republican Congress. As Conservative National Review says, his weakness for half-baked and not especially conservative ideas made him a poor speaker of the House. He appears unable to transform or even govern himself. Newt Gingrich, too much baggage. Restore Our Future is responsible for the content of this message. I'll give you a couple more here. The crime, Medicare fraud. The victims, American taxpayers. The boss, Mitt Romney. Romney supervised a company guilty of massive Medicare fraud. That's a fact. $25 million in unnecessary blood tests right under Romney's nose. Romney pocketed a half a million dollars. Cost to taxpayers, $40 million. Get the facts at nitsbloodmoney.com. Winning Our Future is responsible for the content of this ad. Good evening. Newt Gingrich, who came to power after all, preaching a higher standard in American politics, a man who brought down another speaker on ethics accusations. Tonight he has on his own record the judgment of his peers, Democrat and Republican alike, by an overwhelming vote. They found him guilty of ethics violations 
They charged him a very large financial penalty, and they raised, several of them, raised serious questions about his future effectiveness. I'm Mitt Romney, and I approve this message. Okay. So let me jump and give you a, a short little presentation which puts some of what we're seeing now into context. So I think if I press that, will I get PowerPoints? They're coming. I think they're coming. There we go. Let's just start with my uh, my favorite cartoon here. Um, you know, so Mike was absolutely right. We thought it was sort of you know cute when there was only 50 or 60 percent negative advertising in Iowa, um, and then it was 92 percent of the advertising in the last week in Florida was negative, which is which is truly a a very large number. Um, and this is actually a uh, a, a cartoon by. Uh, Pulitzer Prize winner Mike Lukovich from a couple couple years ago. Sheikh Abdul is a lying flip flopper. I'm Sheikh Abu, and I approve this ad. An American style democracy is coming to Iraq, uh, and I'm going to come back to that slide at the uh, at the end, and perhaps put a little different spin on what I think the uh, the point of it was. Um, but the fact of the matter is, people really don't have very nice things to say about negative advertising. And let's look at some press coverage from New York Times, Washington Post. Um, uh, uh, Boston Globe, recent coverage about negative ads. And you see it. The view from American living rooms is not a pretty one. These negative ads are killing our democracy. Negative ads are more frequent. They're also more vitriolic. The battle of ne negative television spots started earlier this year than any other. There was a problem with this document. Okay. Well, click. Okay. Uh-oh. Well, if the other slide was there, it would have four other quotes from New York Times, Washington Post, talking about how negative the campaign is. So implicit in that cartoon, okay, we'll try it one more time here. Oh. Implicit in that, I'll have my back to it. You can tell me whether it's there or not. Implicit in that cartoon, implicit in all of those, uh, of those media quotes are that negative campaigning is bad, that it's gotten worse, that American citizens are worse, and that American citizens are worse because of all this negative campaigning. So I sort of lied, so you can do a negative ad against me. Those won't, they were recent, paraphrasing another great political line, it sort of depends what you mean by recent. Those are actually articles dating back to 1980. So front page New York Times or front page of Washington Post going from 1980 talking about how this was the most negative ever and how all this advertising was killing our democracy. Again, I think that reason, uh, reason uh, ad that they put together uh, uh, also makes the same point. We can go, be, we can go back even, even farther. Look at Thomas Jefferson versus John Adams, right? You know, American children on the pike is what would happen if, uh, if Thomas Jefferson was elected. Um, you would uh, think of the fun you could have had in the uh, campaign with, uh, with Andrew Jackson, whose mom was uh, accused of being a British whore. I mean, you can just imagine. I once wanted to give my students an assignment where they had to make an ad from that election. You could sort of see, like, you know, British soldiers slinking out of a room and then Andrew Jackson's mom um, standing there. Um, you know, so the point is, all of this talk about the most negative ever, negative advertising, is absolutely, is absolutely not new. So I think we can say both from those very quick examples, from the examples that you gave, from the examples that launched our time here, that campaigns are not negatively, not necessarily worse. And that's not even going into the whole discussion of yellow journalism around, uh, around the turn of the century and the sorts of messages that were put out in, uh, in American politics. Politics. And when you actually look at the scholarly evidence, there's strong theoretical reasons and actually pretty strong empirical evidence to show that negative advertising doesn't always mobilize, doesn't always inform, but not only the work that I've done, the work that I've done with my colleague Paul Friedman at the University of Virginia, um, with Mike Franz at Bowdoin, with Travis Riddout at Washington State, that others have done, like Daryl West, who used to be at Brown, who's now at Brookings, um, that a number of other scholars have done, really there's been only one major scholarly article that has found that negative advertising has a demobilizing effect 
All of the other work has either found sort of a null effect, no real effect, or in fact that negative advertising mobilizes, negative advertising actually informs people. Again, we can all point to an outrageous commercial or two or three or four. But on average, negative commercials are more likely to be factually correct, and negative commercials are more likely to talk about issues. You know, the other Ike commercial I guess you could have shown, which is my favorite Ike commercial, is just a 30-second cartoon of people going, Eisenhower, 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 I won't do it for the full 30 seconds, I promise you. That's a positive ad. We all agree that's a positive ad. Now, it was a little, you know, after the 50th, 15th second ad, that might have been tough, you know, uh, watching the Eisenhower ad. And we can talk about how much information there was actually in it. But I'd rather have the Daisy commercial, a negative ad, a nuclear ad, than an ad which was just Eisenhower, 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 Eisenhower on this cartoon. Now, I am not completely Pollyannish. There are obviously serious things wrong with American democracy. But can we say that those serious things that are wrong with American democracy are because of advertising in general and because of negative advertising in particular? And I think the answer is no. Now, I had all sorts of other charts and graphs. You can believe me that this is, this is the case. If we looked at, when I would be concerned is if one side had a voice and the other side didn't have the voice. So the swift boat, every time I would give one of these talks and I would go out for the University of Wisconsin and give talks to alumni associations and, and, and various groups, um, and someone would always raise their hand and go, well, what about the swift boat ad? And I said, listen, it's not my place to say whether the swift boat ad is right or wrong, accurate or not accurate. John Kerry had plenty of chance to respond. They made a strategic choice not to respond. And in fact, the Kerry, I, think, I think the Kerry campaign finally responded a couple months ago, actually, literally. <laughs> the Kerry campaign and Move On, the media fund on the other side, actually out-advertised George W. Bush in 2004. You may agree or disagree with what was said, but it wasn't the case that only one side had voice. And we can talk about what's happened in American elections, you know, very, very significant changes in campaign finance law and how that has changed the distribution of who airs ads between candidates, parties, and groups. And clearly groups are airing more ads. But when you look back at the 2002 midterms, 2006 midterms, 2010 midterms, and you look at top Senate races, overall, it was not the case in competitive races that one side had a voice and the other side didn't have a voice. People had plenty of, plenty of time, plenty of chance to hear their say. In fact, the most one-sided advertising I ever saw was in the 2008 presidential race when John McCain took the federal money, Barack Obama didn't. That said, even though Barack Obama heavily out-advertised out the John McCain campaign, you can't say that John McCain did not have a chance to respond, either through debates, either through free media coverage, and he also had, it actually sort of does, seem, you were talking about quaint numbers, you know, $70 million in advertising, which will be a very quaint number this cycle, still had the ability to get his message out. So there's a very, uh, you know, famous quote from Justice Brandeis that talks about, you know, the remedy for bad speech is more speech. I would be more concerned about advertising in general and negative advertising in particular if it was only one side who was doing it, only one side had a voice, and the other side wasn't able to respond. But I think there is Plenty of money out there, for better or worse, for both sides to respond, and plenty of access, certainly in the presidential election, certainly in competitive elections, for candidates to, uh, to, uh, to have their say. So look forward to uh, continuing the conversation, and uh, very much thank everybody for uh, letting me be here today. Thanks a lot.